Two, let me do this. Hello. Hey, Terry. How are you doing? <clears throat> good. How are you? Good. Good. You hear okay? Huh? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. You fine. Ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, excited to hear your uh, your talk, Terry. Good. I'm glad. Excited to give it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it makes sense. Oh, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, that took a beat. Vivian, do you have the background? Is that this looking out of Madison's uh, library? That's the por the portico. Uh, yeah, there we go. I didn't. You didn't. You didn't know this, but Vivian's been sleeping and has moved into the attic of the Montpelier Mansion. She's been there for years. <laughs> that, is, that is terrifying. <laughs> All those scraping noises that you hear in the yep. library ceiling. Yep. It's, it's Vivian, uh, <laughs> along with the cat. <laughs> I was all set to sign on, and then I realized that my office was a complete mess. Hmm. <laughs> so I just like, so 
So everything up here, nightmare. Everything oh, back okay. here looks good. I just shoved it all to the front of my office. It looks pretty good. Uh, <laughs> this is the good job. This is where the where we enter and leave the house. So this it's all there's like backpacks and soccer equipment and all kinds of crap like on the other side of the couch just where it should be <laughs> yeah so keep your space sacred well we got a couple uh more minutes before we'll uh we'll begin and i'll, I'll introduce you there terry and um And we're getting ready. We got a uh, our first um, uh, expedition. I'm arriving on Sunday night. Nice. And uh, at this time last week, uh, we were getting ready for Jerome's program to begin. So our first excavation expedition. We have already this yeah. done three expeditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we absolutely have. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, uh. Yep. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that. For that that. That is a qualifier that needs to be added. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Last week was a, a amazing success, but it, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It was amazing. Um, uh, we were gathering up supplies, cutting saplings from the north woods, hickory saplings from doing the they're doing the pig roast, all kinds of things. So, and food was cooked. Pigs were roasted. People. All were full full of food, so perfect. So I think we're at twelve. Yeah, um, we, we can go ahead and go ahead and begin here. Can I do one little um, announcement before we get into it? Absolutely. I just want to um, uh, let folks know because um, the reminder went out today that next month's program on May tenth, which is going to be about subfloor pits is not me giving it. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. um, there's a mistake in the um, uh, the send out. Well, um, it's actually gonna be given um, with Matt, but also with Taylor Brown, who's a former intern and staff member here at Montpelier, who's now a graduate student at the University of West Florida. So um, for those of you who may have met or remember Taylor, it's gonna actually be her doing that program. Mm -hmm. um, and then my only other thing is, if you haven't already, mute yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going through and muting people as I see fit, as dogs bark or phone calls come in. So, well, we're except for you, Terry. You don't need to mute. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Good to see uh, so many uh, faces here, and I'm sure many of y'all are excited to see our old friend, Dr. Terry Brock, back. Um, and uh, for for those of you all that don't know. Terry um, was the uh, um, assistant director of archaeology uh, for about seven years here at Montpelier, six years here at Montpelier, and is now at Wake Forest University, where he um, leads a, uh, a program called Charge, which is a, is a which is a contract arm of Wake Forest, and then also is in charge of the archaeology of the Wake Forest Museum. So he's doing a lot of community engagement and. When he, he's not busy doing that, he's still thinking about Montpelier, and uh, he's currently working on a uh, on a on a project on a on a book project, which we're really excited about, which he's going to be talking about today. And uh, um, uh, Terry began this research. You know, when he, Terry uh, headed up the excavations in the South Yard during the Rubenstein uh, restoration work there where we did about three years of archeology span in the South Yard. And he's produced some fantastic reports on that. Um, uh, and that was, those are some of the things he did right after he left, which is great. And really appreciate Terry sticking with that and getting it done. So, um, but without further ado, um, uh, uh, Terry's talk today is entitled, We Have Enriched It With Our Blood and Tears, Debating Citizenship and Colonization um, and Archeology span at Montpelier. So Terry, take it away. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna I'll get into it into the talk in just a second. Um, the I, I will say that you know the impetus for these ideas actually came from the when we were in the pandemic and and when we were uh, 
all of a sudden the uh, archaeology staff and all of the full-time staff at Montpelier were on the front lines giving tours. And we really had to start doing this work of being really explicit about figuring out how to connect um, the archaeology to, uh, to, to the whole story of Montpelier, right? Um, and, and talking about the Constitution and um, citizenship and, and things like this. Um, more explicitly than we typically had. Um, so that's where a lot of this, um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, started to come from some of the ideas that started percolating from being kind of forced to get more into those elements of um, of Madison and of the country during that time period. But I wanted to start um, real quick, and I don't know if, how many archaeologists are in the room or not, um, but I'm going to be mentioning this individual at some point during my lecture, and I wanted to uh, just take a second to acknowledge um, an important person, an archaeologist who passed away this week. Um, many of you may not know Dr. Paul and Mullen's work, but it's uh, it's really fitting I'm giving a talk about the intersection of race and citizenship since his seminal work, um, Race and Affluence and Archaeology of African American Consumer Culture, was one of the first to tackle the issue. Um, Paul won the first ever John L. Cotter Award from the Society for Historical Archaeology in 2000 and was the SHA president from 2012 to 2013. He was also a native of Richmond, Virginia. And during his time as president, he was an ardent supporter of Montpelier's work in metal detecting. Um, which was a particularly hot issue during the um, during his presidency um, with the Society for Historical Archaeology, um, and I, I think if not for Paul asking Matt to be on that commission um, when the Digger Show um, was going on uh, what, almost ten years ago now, that that program with the with the Digger's Television program probably never would have happened. Um, Paul also guided the organization towards taking instant meaning. The Society for Historical Archaeology and taking institutionalized racism seriously and adopting a number of anti-racist policies within the organization. Um, and he was also president when I was asked to develop SHA's social media strategy as a graduate student and was one of the many um, archaeologists in the SHA who um, uh, was a really important mentor and, and welcomed me into the discipline and, um, and uh, took my ideas and contributions seriously, which doesn't always happen when you're in graduate school. So I'm, I'm deeply indebted to him. So anyway, I'd encourage you all to look into his work, um, uh, whether it's the archaeology of race, the archaeology of donuts, uh, or hoarder television shows, Paul saw archaeology everywhere. Um, and uh, and I just wanted to take a, take a minute to acknowledge his contribution. Okay. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. Will they drive us from our property and homes, which we have earned with our blood? In 1829, David Walker wrote these words in his Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, a pamphlet written in response to the growing debate over American citizenship, a debate that was intimately tied to questions about race and slavery. Walker's pamphlet, which sent shockwaves through the slaveholding South, was part of a lengthy debate over what defined American citizenship. The US Constitution establishes the mechanisms, mechanisms of our government, and the Bill of Rights was designed to protect the rights of citizens from that government. But what actually defined the US citizen remained unclear and unsaid in these documents. It was not until the Naturalization Act of 1790 um, when citizenship was restricted to the people who were white placing Black and Indigenous Americans outside of the purview of federal citizenship. And no policy better supported the young nation's desire to see itself as racially and culturally homogenous than the policies of removal that were championed through the late 18th and 19th centuries, namely colonization and the in, um, and Indian Native American removal. And here's the Native American Removal Act from 1830. One colonizationist, Zacchaeus Lee, Stated, that the stated this objective pretty thoroughly during the 1836 annual meeting of the American Colonization Society by calling the United States a, quote, white man's home. He said a bunch of other things, too. We'll cover some of it um, later. 
These policies reflected the merger of white national identity and republicanism, placing people of color outside of the Republican experiment. This became the basis of Cheryl Harris's argument for whiteness as property. Only white people could claim unequivocally the protections of citizenship. By the middle of the 1810s, colonization was one of the leading abolitionist policy ideas. And in 1817, the American Colonization Society, the ACS, was formed to promote it. And by 1822, it had secured the colony of Liberia in West Africa to serve as the location for emigration. In the 1820s, a number of free blacks relocated there. The policy was one of the most popular approaches to abolition at the time, finding support among enslavers, white abolitionists, and some members of the black community. Establishing a racial, racially homogenous free population in the United States removed the ambiguity that was felt by whites towards free blacks. They were believed to be a violent threat, um, and they also threatened this idea of, of, of who, who can be a citizen because um, uh, they were not enslaved blacks, they were free blacks. Additionally, colonization, they believed, provided an opportunity for African Americans to, quote, gain political agency in an African democracy, which would simultaneously bestow, quote, new blessings, civil and religious, on the quarter of the globe in most need of them, unquote. Colonizationists saw this as both a means towards a white society and a, a way to rid themselves of the sin of slavery and to advance democracy abroad. James Madison first voiced his support of the colonization theory in 1789, only a few years after the Constitutional Convention and the ratification of the Constitution. The problem of slavery and its threat to the stability of the Union was fresh on his mind, as the political status of Black Americans one of the, was one of the central debates at the convention. Madison saw the young nation facing two fundamental evils, the disunion of the states and slavery. Madison also believed slavery to be an immoral institution for both the enslaved and the enslaver. And in his life, early life, he appeared to see, or at least was willing to articulate to his father, these connections. He even writes in 1783 to his father about one enslaved laborer, William Gardner, who he sold into indenture in Philadelphia um, because he, Madison could, quote, cannot think of punishing him by transportation merely for coveting that liberty for which we have paid the price of so much blood and have claimed so often to be the right and worthy the pursuit of every human being. A few years later, following the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, Madison composed uh, what is called the Memorandum on, a on an African Colony of Freed Slaves. It is one of the most fascinating pieces of writing from Madison that I've ever read. For it, he outlines from his somewhat nuanced perspective, first, the importance of ending slavery. Second, the challenge of ending slavery. Third, the reason the challenge exists. And fourth, why a colony for freed slaves is the only peaceful and possible solution. And since I since I know the room is the Zoom is full of Madison nerds, I wanted to dive into this one a little bit because I don't think we talk about this document enough. So first, Madison addresses that a colony for freed slaves may encourage enslavers to manumit their enslaved laborers, and may even quote afford the best hope yet presented of putting an end to slavery, in which not than six hundred, not less than six hundred thousand unhappy Negroes are now involved. He certainly exemplifies in this document some enthusiasm for ending slavery. He also addresses the challenge of manumission. Madison argues that the only way for successful and peaceful manumission would be through the, quote, complete incorporation of the free black population into the society. And by this, he means the citizenry. He makes an argument that would later be held by many members of the ACS that blacks and whites would not be able to live peacefully together. His reasoning, however, is not one that we often expect a white male slave owner from the 1780s to articulate. The complete incorporation of blacks into the citizenry would be impossible due to the prejudices of whites, prejudices which proceeding principally from the difference of color must be considered permanent and insufferable. So James Madison is saying that white racism is the reason why black people and white people won't be able to live together in 1789. As he states again in 1819, quote, if the blacks, strongly marked as they are, be retained amid the whites under the de under the degrading privation of equal rights or political or of equal rights, political or social, they must be always dissatisfied with their condition as a change only from one to another species of oppression, unquote. Madison believed that it was white racism and the policies and actions that came from it that would continue to not deny black people a, quote, condition and a state of freedom preferable to his actual one state of bondage, unquote. 
Because white racism was, quote, insuperable, then free blacks must be, quote, removed beyond the region occupied by a white population. Colonization was the only solution in Madison's eyes. Despite Madison's seemingly enthusiasm, seeming enthusiasm in 1789 for manumission, Madison was also an enslaver for his entire life. He inherited his father's 5,000-acre slave plantation in 1801, and he would never free a single person. And he would, in fact, sell 13 people in 1834. He left his enslaved property to his wife, Dolly, when he, when he died, and she sold most of them before her death. Um, as for colonization, his writings throughout his life oscillate between enthusiasm for colonization and frustration with it, acknowledging at times its impracticability and the threats he he perceived its failure would have towards his experiment in Republican government. Nonetheless, he clung to colonization his entire life. He became a lifetime member of the ACS in 1816. Here's his certificate. Um, and he became president of the ACS in 1833, a position that he held until his death in 1836, when he left the organization $2,000 in his will. So even in death, he supported the ACS. Even then, he understood well the resistance to colonization amongst the African-American community when he writes, quote, at present, there is a known repugnance in those already in a state of freedom to leave their native homes. And among the slaves, there is an almost universal preference of their present condition to freedom in a distant and unknown land. So he writes that in a letter in 1833, literally the same year that he is becoming president of the organization. Madison's lament is a response to the intense amount of Black political activism that colonization generated during the 1820s and 30s. As historian Manisha Singh notes, this activism led to the publication of the first Black newspaper, the Freedom's Journal, national conventions, and a number of political pamphlets. The critique itself stood on the firm resolution that, as Reverend Richard Allen stated, this land which we have watered with our tears and our blood is now our mother country, and we are well satisfied to stay where wisdom abounds and the gospel is free. Samuel Cornish, the founder of the Freedom's Journal, further warns that the effort to view Blacks as, quote, separate people and a, quote, dangerous evil were designed to support colonization. He urged people not to leave their, quote, native land. David Walker takes this a step further in his appeal, arguing that it has been through the shared experience of slavery and oppression that African Americans, quote, enriched the land, and that their suffering, through their suffering, the country became, quote, our country, more our country than it is of the whites. In this pamphlet, Walker directly critiques race-based citizenship by making claims for black citizenship, an argument that political scientist Melvin Rogers describes as a call for Americans to, quote, embrace a social and political vision of equal citizenship and freedom, unquote, and to call to black citizens to, occupy a position in which their equal standing and capacity for freedom come into view. At its core, colonization is about place. It's about who belongs in the place and who does not belong in the place. For many colonizationists, the United States is designated for white people, justified by their, quote, triumphant march westward, something that Lee notes in 1836. He continues, here our fathers, our great Anglo-Saxon fathers, founded this spreading empire and enkindled those lights of civilization we must go go on conquering and to conquer it's interesting in this little section here <clears throat> he talks about um how this is not the black man's country and that we propose to take him to his native soil whereas you see the um david walker and his colleagues talk about how the united states is their native soil so there's a lot of this um, debate about place and who belongs where <clears throat> happening. For Walker, Black people have strong claims to the physical place and therefore to citizenship due to their relationship to the land and what they have done on it. He takes colonization to task by making claims on the physical land of the United States. Throughout the text, Walker juxtaposes the ACS's efforts at the displacement of Black people with an argument for their emplacement as owners of property. Will any of us leave our homes and go to Africa? I hope not. Let them commence their attack upon us, driving and beating us from our country, and my soul to theirs. for theirs, they will have enough of it. Let no man of us budge one step and let slaveholders come to beat us from our country. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. 
The greatest riches in all America have risen from our blood and tears. And will they drive us from our property and homes, which we have earned with our blood? This paragraph is one of many that argues that the placement of Black people in the United States through their actions and labor with the land is a strong argument for their citizenship, more so even than that of white people. Right, And he's talking in that paragraph about creating homes, about building families, about um, uh, creating communities. Walker makes a similar critique of the founding generation when he addresses the issue of humanity, and particularly using Thomas Jefferson's statement in Notes of the State of Virginia, where Jefferson concludes that, quote, this unfortunate difference of color and perhaps of faculty is a powerful obstacle to the emancipation of these people. Walker regularly critiques the, the association of black people with being brutes and takes to task the claim, um, the, the founders claim to founding a, quote, Republican land of liberty while holding people in bondage. He wonders, who is more brutish, the people held in bondage or the, quote, unjust, jealous, unmerciful, avaricious, and bloodthirsty set of beings always seeking after power and authority, unquote, who are holding them in bondage? David Walker did not hold back. Walker and his colleagues spend time on this critique. The characterization of Black people as brutish is designed to place them, quote, outside the human family and therefore lacking the capacity or the faculty for freedom and citizenship. Walker then turns this critique into a challenge. Melvin Rogers argues that Walker's focus on focus is with how we understand ourselves given the description we come to accept and how acceptance of that description opens or closes possibilities. Walker gives his readers a choice. Quote, I'm glad Mr. Jefferson had advanced his position for your sake, for you will either have to contradict or confirm him by your own actions. You have to prove to the Americans in the world that we are men and not brutes. Cast your eyes on the wretchedness of your brethren, and to do your and to do your utmost to enlighten them. Go to work and enlighten your brethren. Through political enlightenment, he argues, black people demonstrate their humanity and, therefore, a right to citizenship. Okay, so I'm, I promise I'm talking going to talk about archaeology now, <laughs> um, but I, that's all an important uh, piece to set this all up. So what is the point of this talk, right? And what I want to talk about here is how, how does the archaeological record inform the debate about citizenship that's happening in the United States at this moment in time? On its surface, this might seem like a question that is outside the purview of the archaeological record, right? How can you see citizenship in cultural landscapes and material objects? And even if you are seeing citizenship, how do you know if you're seeing citizenship? Right? Few archaeologists have actually tackled citizenship as a concept directly. Stacey Lynn Camp's Archaeology of Citizenship is, is certainly one of those instances um, uh, and where she looks at citizenship in the context of uh, early 20th century um, America, in particular, um, looking at uh, immigration uh, from, from Asia. And Paul Mullins, who I mentioned earlier, addressed ways that post-emancipation Black Maryland, Marylanders made claims on citizenship in the late 19th century uh, through consumer culture. Similarly, archaeologists have looked at material culture and cultural landscapes, particularly in plantation contexts, to make plenty of arguments about the political ideology of the people who owned those, um, those plantations and spaces. Mark Leone's famous analysis of the William Packard Gardens or the work of Henry Miller examining the way I examine the idea of freedom of conscience was demonstrated through the 17th century landscape design of St. Mary's City in Maryland are both good examples of the ways that archaeologists have um, shown that political ideas can be expressed through um, cultural landscapes or material objects. This type of analysis relies on the understanding that human beings engage in a process of placemaking. They imbue, we imbue space with meaning through acting on that, that space in specific ways. This borrows from scholars such as the Fieber and Soha and Tuan and is particularly useful when looking at contested spaces such as the plantation, where the same spaces are being interpreted differently by people and groups with different objectives and coming from different, with different identities. Montpelier is no different, and James Madison's formal grounds are a good example of how the material record reflects the Madison's claim to citizenship. James and Dolly returned home from the White House in 1817 to a newly redesigned landscape and home. The new landscape reflects James's commitment to Republican political principles. The most notable change is the garden folly that reflects a temple to liberty, a symbol of the American Revolution. Throughout the house interior are decorative nods to the political thought leaders that influenced Madison. 
There was intentionality in every decision, and these decisions sought to present Madison as a leader in the world of enlightened political thought, representing his own claims to citizenship as a shaper of American political concepts and policies. Madison's claims to citizenship were also demonstrated through his enslavement of Black people, where he is able to show that he both owns property and that he is not owned. You can't be a citizen if you are enslaved. As Cheryl Harris argues, this is a fundamental concept of how citizenship becomes fundamentally tied to whiteness. It is the defining characteristic that belongs, whiteness is the defining characteristic that belongs exclusively to U.S. citizens in the 1780s, as you not anymore, fortunately. The ownership of enslaved people is written across the plantation landscape. There's a presence of dwellings for enslaved people. Additionally, Madison's plantation landscape demonstrates his commitment to separation, ranging from interior separation on the main house. Sorry, I'm getting feedback. Are you? Okay. I'm finding folks that have unmuted. All right. Thank you. Additionally, Madison's plantation landscape demonstrates his commitment to separation, ranging from the interior separation of the main house through doorways, servant stairs, and wraparound hallways to the exterior, which positions slave quarters, outbuildings, and agricultural buildings in separate and subservient positions to the Madisons and to the white overseers. A commitment to this spatial separation and the surveillance that accompanies it precludes his colonization policy that insists that white and black people cannot live together peacefully. Even fewer archaeologists have examined the ways that enslaved African Americans made claims on citizenship. Uh, archaeologists have historically couched the political actions of enslaved Blacks within the context of resistance. However, none of the scholarship ties these acts of resistance to acts about claiming citizenship. However, I believe that the language of Black political activists such as David Walker provide the critical link between the daily actions of enslaved people and their claims on citizenship which they do through their emplacement on the landscape and the overtly political ways that they reflect their own humanity and enlightenment through the material culture. We examine the material signatures of the people enslaved by the Madisons through the lens of Bell Hooks's concept of home place. We can see how the people who lived and worked in the South Yard at Montpelier were also expressing their political agency and making claims on citizenship via Walker's arguments of emplacement and humanity. <clears throat> Hooks describes home place as a type of placemaking conducted by African-American women throughout history. The conversion of the home to a place, I'm just going to read, read this quote for you, place of care and nurturance in the face of the brutal, harsh reality of racist oppression or sexist domination. The construction of a home place, however fragile and tenuous, had a radical political dimension. One's home place was the one site where one could freely confront the issue of humanization, where one could resist. Black women resisted by making homes where all Black people could strive to be subjects, not objects, where we could be affirmed in our minds and hearts despite poverty, hardship, and deprivation, where we could restore to ourselves the dignity denied us on the outside in the public world. Hooks is identifying a particularly, particular form of emplacement, of placemaking, specific to the redefinition of the home as a place of refuge from oppression, a place of freedom within a place of unfreedom and that allows them to confront the issue of humanization. In many ways, this supports both of Walker's arguments. It argues who argues for emplacement, and it, and it provides a place for African-Americans to engage in the process of performing, practicing, and protecting their humanity. Archaeologist Whitney Battle Baptiste provides the critical link between hooks and archaeology through her work in Black feminist archaeology and her discussion and development of a concept called, which she calls home space. It's here that we can see the material dimensions of home place at work. So if Battle Baptiste is connecting to Hooks and Hooks connects to Walker, then archaeology should be able to demonstrate that creating home place is a means of creating and a means of claiming citizenship. <clears throat> For this presentation, I'm going to focus on the excavations of the South Yard, um, although I think that a lot of this some of these ideas apply to the rest of the landscape as well. The excavations we conducted over three, um, there were conducted over three total field station, uh, field seasons and focused each year on a different set of structures. Guided by the 1837 insurance map, excavations exposed six structures. First, we identified the double quarters that had intact central chimneys and foundations. Second, we discovered the smokes houses, which were built with wooden sills and had earthen floors and central fire pits. And lastly, we exposed the north dwelling and the south kitchen, um, which 
Each had continuous brick foundations and gable-ended chimneys. We also uncovered a great deal of the central yard spaces and areas in between the structures, revealing numerous features, outdoor cooking areas, and evidence of temporary work areas. It sounds like all of which were put to good use this weekend um, on your program. I'd like to begin by talking about these yards as the first space that we're going to explore uh, as we talk about the process of making place, placemaking. Excavations of the yard spaces were extensive in the South Yard. Those provided heavy sampling, yielding thousands and thousands of artifacts, allowing us to look in detail at the way that yard spaces were treated. Comparing the results allowed us to show patterns regarding the way that different areas within the South Yard were used, reflect, reflecting the... Hold on. Sorry, I just lost my place. Apologies. Um, comparing the results allowed us to show patterns regarding the way that different areas within the South Yard were used, reflecting the activities of enslaved laborers and how they were actively defining the place of the yards on their own terms and through their own labor. So let's look at some maps. All of these show distributions of a different type of artifact, ceramics, bottle material, and bottle glass, which are uh, most reflective of disposal activity and occur in very high quantities. As you can see, they cluster around the work buildings, um, such as the kitchen and the smokehouses. Um, the areas near dwellings, particularly in front of in front of these dwellings, are mostly clear of debris. Similarly, archaeological features such as post holes, basins, and burned areas cluster around the work buildings, not the domestic yards. This suggests an activity that archaeologists have identified at a number of other um, domestic sites um, where enslaved people live, and which is documented as a traditional practice in African and African American communities. Yard sweeping. This is the active practice of pushing debris out from the center of the yard to its edges in order to create a clean space in front of the buildings. It serves a number of purposes. A clean yard removes risks of rodents and bugs. It ensures a safe space for people to carry out domestic tasks and for children to play outdoors without fear of stepping on broken glass or nails. It also serves a spiritual purpose. Scholars such as Dr. Baptiste, Battle Baptiste, argue that the act of sweeping pushes away bad spirits, creating a protective boundary around the yard space. Additionally, it has a visual impact on the yard. The sweeping kills the grass, leaving a hard packed clay surface. This visual boundary was a way for African Americans to expand their space from the restricted interiors of the homes and into public view. They pushed the boundaries of home place into the yards. Allowing trash to accumulate in the work areas also signifies the creation of a boundary, a separation between how the community views their workspace, where they were forced to labor, and their home space. Clearly, the creation of a home space that reflects their traditions and is separate from their workspace is critical to them. And this way, we see the treatment of yards as one way that the enslaved community provides an alternative perspective on the space of the South Yard, whereas the Madison see this as an area as an area for support services for their entertainment and political and plantation landscape. For the African-American community, there are sharp distinctions between where their enslaved labor and their family life take place and lays claim to those spaces. What is additionally notable is the identification, maintenance, and modification of both places of both the places of work and home. Here we see them creating separation between those two places, where they're forced to labor and where they live. I think this is significant in the context of Hooks's definition of home place, which requires separation from the spaces of oppression. Right. So this is a, a there's a clear demarcation that that's being established um, between spaces of oppression and the and the space of home place. Additionally, the presence of workplaces, one designed specifically. Uh, specifically to support and bolster the wealth and the political aspirations of the Madisons, gives testimony to Walker's claim that America was built on the blood and tears of Black people. In fact, one could extend that argument at Montpelier to the birth of the entire American experiment. If it were not for these enslaved workspaces, would Madison have had the resource, time, or education to spend six months studying and drafting the Virginia Plan in preparation for the Constitutional Convention? You could imagine Walker's exasperated tone if he decided to address this in his pamphlet. protecting home place. Excavations around the double quarter buildings expose two different types of architectural styles. The structure of the Southwest 
building was built on brick piers with a central brick chimney, while the second was built on stone foundations with a central stone chimney base. Each served domestic functions, and as I noted earlier, represented, or I didn't mention that I took that part out. Never mind. <laughs> Excavations on the southwest duplex made a unique find, a large quartz crystal positioned near the northwest pier. Crystals, particularly of this size, are a rarity. In 30 years of excavations, we've only identified one that's even close to this size. This suggests that the crystal was not located in this area by happenstance, but instead was intentionally placed. The correlation with the corner of a building is not, also not unusual. Other archaeological excavations, oral traditions, and contemporary practices by African-American families suggest that putting objects of significance in the corners of buildings or rooms was a practice for protecting the space from spirits and bad luck. We uncovered similar features at the southeast double quarter. In that building's northwest corner, it was revealed a pile of glass in a small hole buried directly underneath the corner of the structure. The removal of the cornerstone of the northeast corner revealed a single ceramic shirt located beneath it, directly in its center. And that was that was like a hundred pound stone. That thing was very heavy. Um, and directly below the foundation under the doorway was a glass tumbler that had been placed in a hole facing directly up. In all instances, we have other indications of the practice of intentionally placing objects at corners or areas of entrance and egress. The tumbler, for example, like re represented a trap for spirits who would fall into the tumbler if they tried to enter the building. These practices are ways of protecting and claiming these houses of bondage from the external world. These are like the security systems for these structures, right? By using spiritual practices to protect their homes, the families that live in them are making claims of ownership over these spaces that the Madisons use to house his property. This is part of the process of making home place. They are creating a, quote, private space where they will not directly encounter white racist aggression, unquote, which is a quote from Bell Hooks, right? So this, it's, this is a, an effort to, to, to further protect the, the home place so that the activity that... Um, uh, that happens inside it, the political activity that Hooks talks about can occur. Okay. Another example is making home place. A third way that African Americans were defined spaces of bondage was through their consumer choices. A common myth that we see in the understanding of how African Americans acquire goods was through hand-me-downs from planters. However, the data from Montpelier shows a dramatically different story. We've identified and cataloged thousands of ceramic shirts from across the property. No particular note of those artifacts were covered from the South Yard, which belongs to enslaved laborers, and those were covered from an enormous trash deposit on the north side of the main house, which is full of goods associated with the Madisons. And, and this is like full hats off to Matt and Mary for, for this uh, incredible analysis. Um, I'm just borrowing it because teamwork. Right. Um, to analyze the ceramics, um, Montpelier works from the sherd to the vessel to the set. This is a way of getting minimum counts of vessels across the property. It helps us understand um, what people are consuming, what, what choices they're making. Sets give us an idea as to what groupings of ceramic styles and decorations people are acquiring. Dr. Reeves and Dr. Furlong Makoff have done this for both ceramics for each of these areas. In the South Yard, there is evidence for 109 sets being represented. Also, I, this is these numbers are probably different now, so, but because um, uh, it's, I feel like Mary is constantly discovering new sets. Um, but uh, I, I imagine that the the argument still holds. Um, in the South Yard, there's evidence for 109 different sets being represented, and the Madison's garbage only 20. What is interesting is that when we compare these assemblages. There is some overlap. Half of the Madison ceramics are identified in the south are identified in the South Yard, but that makes up only a tiny fraction of the total sets that are represented in the South Yard, right? Only around 10 percent, less than that. The data shows that the Madisons in the enslaved community are acquiring different ceramic wares. And in those spots when we do see the overlap, a difference still remains. The form of the vessel is unique. So we see large platters and large bowls being reused by the enslaved community. Likely a platter gets a chip in it, making it unacceptable for the Madison's table, but not making it unusable. This object would have been impractical to purchase, but could be taken for free in this instance and representing a type of dish that would have been too costly to buy at market. So what does this mean? Well, it's evident that African-Americans had access to local markets. They were able to purchase and barter goods. This also means that the people living in these buildings were making choices about what they purchased and how they decorated their tables and their homes. 
Objects, colors, and decorations could be selected that were appealing. Ceramics could be handed down through generations, connecting people to their ancestors. Part of home place is the idea of care and nurturance. By decorating the interior of the home in ways that reflected personal choice and by acquiring their own property, they were making a place that reflected their own needs and the needs of their community. And the act of, decora the act of decorating a home is an act of claiming ownership and reflecting, and reflecting one's personal values and beliefs. This is something I think that we all understand, right? When you move into your dorm room or your new house or your apartment, you're engaged in the process of homemaking. You decorate it with your stuff. You go to Target, right? Um, uh, this is a form of placemaking, and that's what we're seeing happening in these houses of bondage. It's within these home places that Hooks argues the work of maintaining and nurturing one's humanity happened. The work that Walker argues is essential to demonstrating one's claim to citizenship. Two pipe bowls found in the South Yard show that this work is happening in ways that address distinctly political views. Uh -oh. The first shows the emblem of the Freemasons. While Freemasonry was well established in the world by the 1820s, this pipe bowl likely belonged to an enslaved African American thereby associating them with the Prince Hall Freemasons. Uh, the Prince Hall Freemasons were the, um, uh, the African Lodge, um, and, and they had to travel to uh, Europe in order to get chartered because none of the Masonic Lodges in the United States would, would uh, charter a, uh, a lodge made up entirely of African Americans. So, um, so they actually are completely separate track of masons um uh here in the united states and they're um very much still a very active group um so the masons were in order that celebrated craft right and alignment with walker's argument that the labor that had been put into building the nation was the work of, of black people and as a fraternal order it provided a literal literal response to walker's question are we men i ask you oh my brethren are we men this pipe bowl draws a direct connection between claims of political enlightenment and humanity that walker asked for and the actions of enslaved laborers at montpelier it's also important to note that the prince Hall freemasons were a political entity as an independent black organization they are one of the earliest examples of black self-government in the united states their members were politically active, be it through engagement and voting efforts in the North, to working with the Underground Railroad, to expressing political ideas in newspapers and pamphlets. David Walker was a Prince Hall Freemason, and they were, and the Freemasons were connected to both Gabriel's Rebellion in Richmond and the Nat Turner insurrection, either directly or in spirit in some way. My colleague at Wake Forest, Dr. Corey Walker, happened to have written a book about the Freemasons. So that was convenient um and uh and he's argued that the prince hall freemasons were more than a group of craftsmen they envisioned a different nation during the late 18th and early 19th century and wanted african americans to enact a form of cultural solidarity and political subjectivity to create a place for african americans in the realm of american social and political life the presence of this pipe bowl owned by an enslaved person at montpelier suggests a strong ideological connection and performance of the type of citizenship that David Walker was advocating. A second pipe bowl found in the North Dwelling shows the face of Lady Liberty on one side and an eagle with the phrase E Pluribus Unum on the other. Lady Liberty's cap bearing the word Liberty is a Fergian cap worn by emancipated slaves in ancient Rome. The symbol of the American Revolution on a pipe bowl owned by an enslaved laborer begs Walker's original critique of the founders of this Republican land of liberty and stands in contrast to Madison's Liberty Temple. At the same time, it demonstrates Walker's call to Black Americans, enslaved and free, to demonstrate their own political enlightenment as a means of claiming citizenship. I feel like this pipe bowl just kind of speaks for itself. <laughs> but... Um... The debate over citizenship was one that incorporated the question of freedom and unfreedom. Who is a citizen? Whose rights were protected and who belonged? Madison and his colleagues sought to address this ambiguity by adopting policies that sought a cultural, culturally homogenous society that claimed citizenship through their whiteness. And yet they were met by a counter definition of American nationhood, one that considered African Americans as equal citizens and which was defended on the grounds of their humanity and their grounding in place. 
My goal for this paper was to show how the argument of David Walker and his colleagues is reflected in the actions of enslaved African Americans at Montpelier through the material record. We often neglect the political voices of the enslaved because they did not have av they did not have av the avenues to use them, such as the newspapers and things like that. By looking at the material remains of the actions of the people enslaved by the Madisons, we can see that they were also engaged in defining a vision for the nation that incorporated themselves as equal citizens. They actively redefined their prisons as homes, crafting home place so they could care and nurture their families and communities. They engaged in political conversation and political action, and they performed their citizenship using objects to express their political ideas. The actions and debates over American citizenship are not relegated to those who have power or those who are educated. The idea of the American experiment is that we all get to participate in the process of making our union more perfect, a sentiment that Madison protects in the First Amendment, in which the people enslaved by Madison undertook every day. And despite the eventual establishment of birthright citizenship in the Constitution following the Civil War, race and place continued to be intertwined in our politics, be it segregation, redlining, immigration, incarceration, gerrymandering, or determining who gets to participate in equitable, equitable governance of the heritage organizations where their ancestors were enslaved and are buried. As former chairperson of the Montpelier Descendants Committee and now chairperson of the Montpelier Foundation stated last year during the debate over governance of the Montpelier Foundation, we don't just have skin in the game, we have bodies in the ground. I can't think of a much more place-based argument for justifying one's uh, participation in governance than my ancestors are buried here. So even today, the debate over who does and does not get to participate in political governance is tied intricately to issues of race and place. The archaeology provides evidence that enslaved African Americans at Montpelier were actively taking part in claiming citizenship as part of the Black political critique of Madison's support of colonization. And now, the archaeology provides support for the continual claims of their descendants for equitable power sharing in the governance of their ancestral home place. So it can continue to be a site where we can explore the complex discussions of how Americans have grappled with the complexity of citizenship throughout history. I'm done. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Terry. It, uh, you and I have, uh, you've talked to me about these ideas for many years and I've heard 20 minute conference presentations, but to hear the 45 minute one is uh, pretty mind blowing. Um, so I wanted to open it up uh, the floor for questions. Um, and uh, while you all are uh, generating your questions, does anyone have you can either mute um, or put them into the uh, into the into the text chat, um, or if you want to, you can uh, raise your raise your hand, and that'll put you in the 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 front of the line to to be able to ask your uh, question. There's more of you here than when I started sharing my screen. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, Terry, while well, people are getting the oh, oh, Patrice, Patrice. yay! <laughs> Hi, Terry. How are Hi, you? I'm good. How are you, Patrice? I mean, absolutely fascinating the way in which you have intersected um, geography of place with archeology, span as well as civics and African-American studies is just groundbreaking to me. So the first thing I wanna find out is the paper that you've written, is that coming out in a journal article or you know, how are you intending to continue to expand this work because it is, um, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you know, but, but, but my initial scholarship was civic education in mid 20th century America for African Americans. And I always, I guess, started with David Walker, mm -hmm. but the thing you have truly pushed me to look at, and I'm just so fascinated to go back and read is, you, I mean, starting, you know, prior to that and how you directly link Madison and the concepts of citizenship to that point in time. That just brings everything so 360. I don't know if any other scholar, you know, in my realm in civic education that has gone back that way to do that. So this is truly a, a, a big contribution to the literature and to the field. Well, thank you. That means uh, so much coming from you. Um, uh, so 
let's see what I am. This is all I'm very early stages on all of this. I've, I just submitted a, um, a NEH grant to see if we can get dedicated time and support for um, for working on this project. Um, I was in a, a session over the winter at the Society for Historic Archaeology conference, and there's, uh, I believe, plans to to take that session and turn it into a, a journal, uh, uh, edited journal volume. So um, I'll be contributing an article there, which will, you know, which is a small segment of it. Um, but as far as, you know, thinking about this book project, it, it obviously comes down to making sure that I have the time, um, time to do it. So, um, so I did recently just apply for NEH fellowship um, for, for that. Um, uh, with the with the support of the um, MDC and 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 uh, and things like and, and the archaeology department and things like that as well. Um, so, uh, and I, and I am, uh, you know, I think you know this focuses this this talk obviously very much focused on the contributions of the enslaved community. I, I think there's, um, you know, I think about the a, a longer form project. I'm also thinking about you know we're actively doing excavations at the overseer's house um uh currently so and then also the way the madisons are are making these same claims on citizenship um and through their cultural uh landscapes and, and material records so so there's a there's a, a whole a whole plantation story to be told about the ways that different groups and are are engaging in, in this process but so anyway I, I hope that addressed answered your question so like I said, I'm really looking forward to following it and, and doing it, uh, but really great work. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Matt. Hi, everybody. Hi, Terry. Um, I have been um, associated with Montpelier since my first archaeology visit there in 2007. And I was at that point uh, fascinated to, to uncover a platter or partial platter um, that had been used by the Madisons. But since then, I have been more interested in the lives of the uh, enslaved people and their descendants and how the archaeology department has um, put forward all this information. And this is a real step forward. Um, uh, my question, I'm not sure if I have a question, but <laughs> uh, I have been reading the 1619 project mm -hmm. and uh, my Quaker meeting has been studying uh, a Pendle Hill pamphlet by a man named Harold Walker. Don't know if it's any relation uh, on uh, race history of a race and, and uh, oh, possible solutions to restitution. Um, I'm looking forward to more information and uh, certainly your project is moving this forward. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, I just saw in the comments that Zeb was want, um, wanted to know where I can get his hands on the um, the memo, and so I, I've just put a link to its transcription and at the founders online. So it's a pretty. It's again, I I find it fascinating. I, I Zeb, I brought this thing out all the time on my tours whenever someone was like. But Madison was a man of his times, right? I'd be like, okay, <laughs> awesome. Let's talk about what he was talking about in 1789, right? Uh, in the infant years of the of the U.S. Constitution, uh, where he's identifying white prejudice as the as the reason why um, uh, 
black and white people couldn't couldn't live together peacefully and um and how um uh black people would uh never be fully satisfied with their con- their condition of freedom in this country um and during the summer of 2022 during the pandemic during black lives matter i didn't have to i didn't have to take it much further than that to for that to to click that madison was seeing into the future in ways that uh um we often don't associate with uh the the founders the the folks from the 17 1790s and 1780s um that's again his solution is a incredibly racist policy right colin right this this assumption that everyone in the acs makes that somehow the uh you know showing up in the united states as a white person means that you belong here um and no one else does including the people who are already here right um as a, a so his his solution to a racist problem was a racist solution so that certainly doesn't justify his solution but it's a really interesting uh um uh it's it's really interesting reading his his uh the way he discusses um this complexity and and how how messy it is here there's a question from Rosalind Moss about the Masonic pipe pole in terms of is there a difference in iconography between the two uh the Prince Hall um Masonic Lodge and the you know it, it, mm-hmm. they try to put a difference into their into their um iconography that's a that's a great question and I don't know um uh but now I'm gonna look <laughs> so thank you Rosalind It, you know, a frustrating thing about the Masons, too, is, you know, they're kind of secretive. So, um, uh, so I'm not, but yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and even then, you know, I think even if the iconography is the same, right, does it, it it's going to mean different things, right, to, to, to differ to to each group of masons because they're you know like the the idea of uh being a a, a craft based organization right that that's got to have a different meaning when you're engaging in your craft and your labor is 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 supporting someone who's holding you in bondage right there's there's just an extra layer to to that than um you know, be belonging to a fraternal order that that uh, has a focus on ideas of masculinity. When you, as an enslaved African American, right, are uh, one of the ways that your power over you is maintained is by stripping away your ability to do things that are considered typically masculine, right? Protecting your wife and children when they could be sexually assaulted or sold away from you at any moment right um so so the 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 meanings behind the iconography is going to sit differently too i think any other questions eric has a question are there future projects uh or wish list projects at montpelier you think that would add to your uh research and ongoing efforts um well i think the work that we're we're doing this summer um at the overseer's house is is and and the analysis that comes out of that will um will will add to this because again this is another 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 group of people that um meaning uh the free free white laborers um non madisons um who lived on the property who um who are also you know uh engaged in this but coming from a different economic situation coming from a different education st- situation right um uh and and so i think that that seeing how they're you know if there's ways that they're expressing their uh their citizenship um and how that how that may uh 
may fit into the story. Um, you know, so that's that's another another piece that I'm interested in. It's it's really easy for us to only talk about race and power in the context of the Madisons and the enslaved people. And um and right, and there's a whole uh spectrum of uh of people who lived on the plantation and certainly lived in the country um that that are gonna be right i mean the, the overseers aren't building a temple to liberty outside of that maybe they did but i doubt it right you know they're gonna have to express these things in, in different in different ways so so that's the big one so Oh, looking through the um, uh, looking through the the chat, uh, a lot of folks really appreciating your uh, your talk today, Terry. And this certainly is a uh, um, one that has special relevance to us here at Montpelier, given given the focus on citizenship and uh, being the home of uh, you know the what's called who's called James Madison, the father of the Constitution. It's it, it's a it's it offers a uh, a real uh, a material contrast to like what you state the temple temple of liberty things that visitors can see things that things that visitors um, can actually experience when they come here to to give that sense of ideological citizenship to enslaved Americans who are here so thank you for everything you're doing Terry. Absolutely. My so pleasure. glad you're you're still a partner with us and uh, you're continuing this work. We're looking for, forward to supporting you for many years to come. I'm looking forward to working with with Montpelier. I as a you know I, I'm just kind of looking around my office. I've got a pipe bowl up there. I got my James Madison bust there. I've got my <laughs> South Yard picture here. Um, half of the sweatshirts I own are Montpelier sweatshirts. So <laughs> there's it's a uh, you know. It's a it's a place that that gets its hooks in you and and um so I'm really it was great to see all of the all of the familiar familiar names and and some familiar faces so looking forward to keep continuing to do this with y'all yeah and hoping you're going to be able to make it out this summer as well Terry it'd be great to have you here for a little more extended period yep I'll so. I'll be there and I'm looking forward to it. Didn't mention Terry is uh, literally he has his students working on uh, Montpelier data, uh, Wake Forest students, which has been been great. So, but um, I will thank you everyone for attending the uh, um, the the uh, Terry's talk today. We are recording this, and I'll go ahead and send this out to all all participants. And if you have any questions, I'll be CCing Terry on this, so you can write him as well with any uh, questions you might have. So, but. Mary, do you have something to add? Let's see. Just, um, see everybody next month on the 10th for for your the program about subfloor pits with Taylor Brown and Matt for those that signed up after the initial announcement. Um, and don't forget to sign up for expeditions. We've got some spaces in the fall that need you there on them participating. So um, <laughs> be sure to check it out. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.